Well, what I want to do today uh, is look uh, at two uh, painters who really were the darlings of the Second Empire and the Third Republic. In other words, their, their careers span uh, those last more or less 50 years, uh, almost going, in fact, going into the 20th century. These two artists are uh, Boubereau, uh, William Boubereau, and uh, Jean-Léon Géron. Uh, that's a real pain, Jean-Léon Géron, because it's got three accents, and that means it takes forever to try and put his name up on the screen. <laughs> Now, these people were uh, epitomised, the, the title of this series, uh, Famous, Fated and Forgotten. Uh, they were born virtually at the same time, 19, uh, 1824, 1825. They both lived till they were 80, so they were really identical careers. Uh, these were the people who were the chairman <coughs> of the jury of the Salon, uh, at that critical time that we were looking at the other day between around about the 1860s at the time of the Impressionists and the Salon des Refusés. These also were men like Maisonnier who were covered in medals, uh, awards, won the prize of Rome and who really were responsible for forming the next generation of artists and who took their jobs incredibly seriously. They saw themselves as the guardian uh, of, of French tradition and of high-minded art. Now, Bouguereau in particular didn't just uh, enjoy a reputation in France, he also was wildly popular in America. And uh, I don't know if any of you have been to these major American collections, but they all have a Bouguereau. Uh, he was very, very popular with the bourgeoisie, and you, you will see why when we actually look at them. Now, these painters then were very, very uh, successful, but virtually just like Maisonnier, within about 20 to 30 years after their death, uh, their art really slipped off the agenda completely. They were really removed to, to back rooms uh, in museums uh, and slipped out of the canon of art history and completely out of art history syllabuses. And it was really only in sort of 1974, uh, there was an exhibition of Bouguereau in America. Someone sort of thought, my goodness, these are so quaint. Let's put them out into the public. And it was quite successful. And it also corresponded with a change in the direction of, of, of art history. Uh, in the 70s, particularly in America, uh, there is a, an interest much less in technique and in provenance and in influence and much more of an emphasis on uh, the political messages or the social messages encapsulated in the images. So in other words, art begins to be used not exactly as a sociological tool, but is looked at by feminists, it's looked at by people who are looking at colonialism, for example, uh, and looking at people who are trying to analyze ideas that uh, were the basis of Western civilization. And so it's at this time that you get a renewed interest in these particular painters, and in particular, uh, Jérôme. Um, this, the 70s is about the time when you begin to get the uh, interest in Orientalism with the publication of Said's book, Orientalism, which uses one of Jérôme's paintings for its front cover. And this uh, painting we will be analyzing in detail today. Now, if you actually look at, at the two painters side by side, they really encapsulate two um, sides of the vision of femininity or the um, attitude towards women in the 19th century, uh, as well as other things, but particularly in the case of Bouguereau. Um, here you have Bouguereau's The Day of the Dead, 1859, and I put the dates because they, uh, you really do need to locate them uh, historically, you know, this is of course in the toward getting towards the middle of the Second Empire, the heyday of Napoleon III, the bourgeoisie, where you have uh, women uh, who are at home, who in really um, in encapsulate or sort of symbolise <coughs> the traditions of the French nation. Now, what was a bourgeois woman? She was someone who was maternal. She was someone who wasn't a sexual creature. She was the angel of the hearth. She was pure. She was virtuous. Um, and it is through her that the next generation will um, take up the 
traditions which make France. So here you have um, a, a painting of a virtuous a virtue, you know, the, the, the woman who is always clothed, you know, who is sexually inaccessible uh, because she's so pure. Um, here, um, dressed in mourning, um, which was one of the sort of major uh, attributes, I suppose, or, or of, of the bourgeois woman, the, the devotion to the dead, right? This idea of, of maintaining traditions, but also in the 19th century, you get a very great interest in death. Uh, that's when you get the great cemeteries being created. Uh, and uh, mourning really becomes a way of life for many women. Now she's here then at a grave, you know, at one of these new cemeteries where the dead really are no longer really gone. They are departed. In other words, you know, they've just gone somewhere, you know. In other words, they're just this death really is a kind of going to the uh, through a curtain to another world. And in fact, at Père Lachaise Cemetery, the main um, monument in Père Lachaise are people sort of actually going through a curtain. Um, as you walk up the main entrance you see this happening. So um, the dead are actually asleep in nature and they have their tombs which you visit just the way you would visit your friends uh, in uh, the centre of Paris. So here you have uh, the, the bourgeois woman whose duty it is to perpetuate the memory of the dead and she's um, passing this on to her daughter. So you couldn't get much more sort of uh, more high-minded. This is an art that reminds women of their duty, that maintains bourgeois values. Now, of course, if you've got women who are like this, um, where do male fantasies go? You know, and uh, so this is actually a de Bapensant. It's not Jérôme, but this is he is one of the Orientalist painters. So here we have the absolute opposite end of the woman question. Now. What do we have here? We have um, a woman who is laid out in, in the baths. She is being, she's completely limp, you know, she's being absolutely, she is simply a body. Uh, she certainly isn't someone who is a, a thinking person or a person who has any life of her own. She really is simply the object of male desire. Uh, and of course, she's being prepared for the bed of the Sultan. So these, um, the, as I said, there was this sort of dichotomy between, you know, the uprightness of the bourgeois woman and, you know, the prostitutes that, that sort of serviced uh, male desire uh, at, at the other end of the scale. But in the 1850, 1850s onwards, all of this sort of the idea of the fantasy of the forbidden and the erotic is transferred from um, ideas of the brothel onto the canvas of the East, all right? So um, this is an emphasis on the harem or the harem, whatever you want, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, and uh, people here have this idea of, of, of women who are sort of sexually available, uh, who actually live simply for that. But it's much nicer to sort of fantasize about these women because they are faithful to one man, you know, which I don't know what male fantasies are like, but I presume that that's what, I don't know how you fantasize when you go to a, a brothel and you're sort of standing in a queue. I don't know. So. Uh, <laughs> You have to have a powerful imagination. I'm, I'm not, not asking for any comments here, but anyway. <laughs> so this then is um, this other side of, of, of the woman. It's, it's the erotic, uh, forbidden side. Now, the other thing which is very interesting when we're going to be looking at these two aspects um, uh, is this development of photography. And these two <coughs> artists that you have seen there develop a style which is they consider as realism. You know, the same thing as we were talking about last week with Meissonnier, developing a realist style for really basically a relatively unreal uh, painting, but bringing it to life because of the style. Now, what is going to happen is that the style is so correct and so my correct in detail and so authentic that therefore the subject matter must be true. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting, and this comes from photography. So you've actually got, with the development of photography in the 1830s from daguerreotypes up to the really development of film in the 1880s with Eastman, <coughs> um, you have two um, different ways of looking at uh, the, the photograph. The impressionists react against it, thinking that, um, well, we already now have something which can capture what is there, we no longer, art no longer is enslaved to that. 
Um, and the realist painters, the academic painters, <coughs> strive basically to uh, capture and, and rival with photography. Now, uh, before I actually begin to look at the development of Orientalism, I just want to sort of give you an example of um, how <coughs> uh, the, uh, these people, Jerome in particular, but Bourgeois as well, were against um, any new developments in art. Remember, the academic art is high-minded, it, it, it is supposed to transfer you into another sphere, it's didactic. And um, Jérôme, who was president of the jury, was, was, was furious that uh, anyone would want to exhibit the paintings of Manet. And when he speaks about Manet, he says, he's chosen to be the apostle of decadent fashion, the art of the fragment. I, for my part, um, was chosen by the state to teach the grammar of art to young students. <coughs> Consequently, I do not think it right to offer them a model uh, of this man who is, has an extremely arbitrary and sensational type of work. He was also the man, Jérôme, who was absolutely against the Caillebotte legacy. Now, Caillebotte, of course, was the Impressionist painter who had collected the works of his fellow Impressionists, and when he died, he willed them to the state and wanted them to be exhibited at the, the Luxembourg Museum. Well, Jerome was having none of this. He says, um, the Institute cannot remain still before such a scandal, in other words, accepting Impressionist art. How can the government dare welcome such a collection of inanities in a museum? Have you seen them? The state, the ward of such junk, uh, the museum, the Luxembourg Museum is a school, which is very interesting then when we, this is going to come through in the sorts of things he's going to be portraying when he portrays the East. So I wanted to have a look in particular in relation to Jérôme at um, the main body of his work, which uh, is around the representation of the Orient. Now, the Orient, for us, of course, means sort of China and Japan. Well, it doesn't mean that for the French in the 19th century. Um, it starts out looking at Egypt. As at the moment, we're going to look at the um, conquest of Egypt by Napoleon. Uh, but it also then, uh, the Orient also starts in Spain, where the Muslims came in, and it also is in Greece, where we're going to look at the war between the Greeks and the Turks. So. Um, the East, or the Orient, basically means Muslim countries for this um, time, the 19th century. Now, the, what, the first part of what I want to look at is the imaginary Orient. All right? There are sort of two types of Orient. The ones which were before the 1830, 1832, when Delacroix goes to Algeria, and after, when the artists start travelling to the East. Um, and a voyage to the East becomes as popular as the Grand Tour, or it, it sort of takes over from going to see Greece and Rome. Everyone now must go and experience the East. And Jérôme, by the way, actually wasn't just an amateur. He actually bothered to learn Arabic so that he felt that he could really um, get into the heart of the matter. Now, um, you're going to get several themes, in fact, three themes that are going to come through either in the imaginary Orient or in the real Orient, as we'll see. The first one is sensuality, uh, the second is savagery, and the third one is the salvation um, brought by Western civilization to these decadent cultures. Right? So, um, a very interesting uh, attitude which, uh, whose legacy we actually are undergoing today. Uh, in 1803, um, Bonaparte, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, goes on the Egyptian expedition um, to cut a very long story short. Uh, while he is there, he, um, his army is contaminated by the plague. And uh, he attempts to attenuate the situation of, about a panic um, that this would, would cause by himself going into the, uh, the kind of makeshift hospital at Jaffa. Now, when he comes back, uh, he, he actually abandons his army and comes back to take up position. He's been told that there, you know, there's a vacuum of power at the top. He 
hot foots it out at night, leaving his generals in charge to come back and take up the position. So when he gets back, he needs to justify his, his departure. He needs to make himself seen as more than just a military uh, commander. So he asks his, one of his pet painters, uh, Antoine Gros, to depict him at the moment that he is in this, this hospital in Jaffa. Now already you have all of the tropes which are going to exist um, for later Orientalism. Right? You have the, the uh, civilizing power of the West. So you have the extremely, uh, there's a very foregrounding of the arches and the architecture, the minarets, uh, in, uh, all in this sort of architecture here. Um, the fluttering of the Republican flag shows that you know, Western values have been implanted. And also center stage amongst the dead and the dying and the sort of, you know, these naked bodies who are being looked at by a, an Arabic or an Egyptian doctor, you have the beautifully clad uh, medical corps behind Bonaparte. Now he, of course, is tarted up to the nines, as you can see for the event, and comes in and is actually touching uh, one of the victims uh, who is, is naked. So this was, he's trying to portray himself as not just a general, but someone who is intrepid in all fields, someone who is at the cutting edge of science, in other words, who understands medical science, but in particular has the cure, you know, this, this power to cure. Of course, the only other person who touches and cures is Christ. Uh, and via Christ, the, the kings of France had the divine right of healing. You know, once a, a, a year, all the scrofula used to sort of line up in front of Notre Dame and the king would touch their heads. Um, so this is Bonaparte positioning himself like this. So, but even though it's his own propaganda, you already have this idea of the colourful nature of the, of the, uh, of the Orient. Their, basically their inability to cope with dramatic situations and the sort of the stalwart cor cor courage of the Westerner. Now, if we now go, continuing with the imaginary Orient, if we now go to Delacroix, um, in 1823, I think it was, there is the War of Independence of Greece. Greece is attempting to um, shake off the shackles of Turkey and uh, there are a number of massacres on both sides which take place. However, the most famous representations that we have of this struggle are those depicted by the romantic artists of the time. This is the time when you get Lord Byron, for example, um, getting, kitting out a whole ship and going over to fight on the side of the Greeks. Now, the Greeks were seen as the stalwarts or the origins of Western civilization. Uh, so you get, you really got this kind of war between us and them, all right? And this is the basis of Orientalism, the idea of seeing um, the people in the Orient as other, as different, uh, which is why this Jerome's paintings are so very interesting because you have the women as other and then you have the whole civilization as other, all right? So uh, it's the idea of power of men over women and power of the West over the East. So here you have, here actually, all of these romantic artists go and depict, now this is still imaginary, and this is a new type of, of battle scene or defeat scene. Um, instead of having the bodies strewn around, you have it looking more like a Greek tragedy with a kind of frieze across the front of the picture plane, done in dramatic, with dramatic brush strokes and colour, right? So Delacroix isn't an academic painter, he's a romantic painter. You can see the, the painter bringing into life this scene. It has a very personal cachet. Uh, he's, of course, one of the people who's going to inspire the impressions with his use of complementary colours and so on. Uh, he was very much criticised at his time for being slapped at. So a very different style from Jérôme. But what do we have here? We have these ideas, ideals of Western society violated, all right? Um, here you have an old woman who is being left destitute, you know, the idea of old age, which is revered in, in, the, in the West, or theoretically. Uh, there we have um, a young mother, again, this, you know, the idea of violating the maternal image of, of, of the mother in, you know, the 1840s, 1820s was, was extraordinary. And of course her child, you know, dependent on her, um, is also being abandoned. So you've got old age, middle age with, you know, the maternal image, and then of course you get um, this young girl, his nubile young girl, who is obviously being taken off and will be, will be raped. So you've got this violation of all aspects of what um, Western society holds dear. 
and these other people sort of slumped um, here as well. Now, who is doing all of this violation? Um, well, he is painted a completely different way. Here you've got people sagging and in a horizontal plane. Here you've got this vertical surging, sort of virile, sort of powerful sort of man, um, colourfully um, turbaned, um, even with the, even the horse looks different from a Western horse. And this woman is, of course, you know, delightfully naked as, as usual, being dragged off. So this is this um, already the, these tropes of savagery, sensuality, and and outrage um, and colourfulness are related to images of the East. Now Delacroix also um, at the time outraged salon um, paint, uh, critics when he submitted this to the salon of 1827. It was said basically that he was probably the illegitimate son of Talleyrand, and this was one of the reasons he even got many of his paintings um, hung. Here we have. Um, this a painting taken from um, Byron's poem, The Death of Sardanapalus. Sardanapalus was uh, an eastern potentate who was defeated. Uh, the enemy was at his walls. And so, of course, he is going to kill himself on a, burn himself to death on a funeral pyre. So this is his funeral pyre. But uh, in typical eastern style, according to Byron and then by uh, Delacroix, he will massacre everything that he held dear um, before he dies. So everything all go is going to go with me. I mean, it's, it's, it does happen nowadays. Um, however, so he has his pages put to death. We won't even think about that. Uh, he has his horses put to death. And of course, he has his harem um, slaughtered as well. Now, well, what is centre stage here? Uh, is this woman sort of arching back about to have her throat slit. So all of this sort of going up to this impassive figure who is very much like the figure of the painter himself done in slapping brush strokes of, you know, sensual colours. Now what is happening here really, why it was an outrage, was it was the ultimate sort of fantasy of the possession of women's bodies basically by murder. Uh, uh, and to be able to live these fantasies through, um, it, it had to be cast into the East. Right? You couldn't cast these fantasies of something like that happening in, even in Greece and Rome, and certainly not in 19th century Paris. All right? uh, this, was the, this was the capital of the bourgeoisie. All right? So um, if you want to do this, you must put it elsewhere. Now, this was uh, before Delacroix um, takes part in a diplomatic mission with the Duke of Mornay, M-O-R-N-A-Y, not the brother, half-brother of Napoleon III, a different Mornay, uh, who goes over at the beginning of the colonial expansion of the French into North Africa. Uh, they will, of course, conquer uh, Algeria, Tunisia, or what is known as the Maghreb, and down south as well. If you if you go to Africa, you have a fair chance of being able to speak French even now. Uh, and Delacroix goes to Morocco on this mission and is absolutely blown away by the colour, by the the light in particular, which doesn't cast seems to cast shadows, uh, and by the simply exotic nature of these people and he, he sees them as quite as noble, he sees them more or less as like the Brutuses and the Caesars of their time in their beautifully uh, hung uh, clothes, he sees them as a bit like the toga. However he does one day uh, gets access in Algiers to a, um, a, a seraglio, a, a harem. Uh, usually it, it, most of his paintings were of Jewish people because the, the Jews in these countries didn't uh, veil their women to the same extent and they were allowed out, they didn't live in, in harems. So to be able to paint women, he often painted Jewish weddings or Jewish women. However, on this occasion he was allowed into the harem. And when this painting was exhibited in the, in the Salon 1834, it just caused a sensation, you know, evidently there was this light and colour as opposed to these drab uh, uh, scenes of, of battle. Of course, as you can imagine, our friend Renoir was licking his lips saying, oh, you can smell the sort of, uh, you know, the flesh of women and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what you have here is going to be the beginnings of uh, Orientalism, that we now have uh, an authentic scene, which is interesting, so you have women doing nothing, you know, and this is the ideal woman, you know, the woman who is simply flesh, she is 
has no sort of subjectivity. Uh, she is the object of the male gaze. And of course, this is why Olympia was so scandalous. You know, she's not only naked, but she's a courtesan, but she's, she's a person as well, not just flesh to be consumed. And these women um, are doing absolutely nothing. As you can see, they're not even talking. They're just sitting, smoking. God knows what they're smoking. Mm -hmm. They're being looked after by another mm -hmm. black maid. And the black maid is going to be something which is always brought in. There's a sort of, you know, little frisson of sexualities we'll see. Now, um, when the French come back from their colonial expeditions, they bring back with them uh, this idea of exotic nature. And those of you who've been to my lectures on absinthe will realize that um, absinthe was one of the drinks that was used by the officers. And, and when they come back, they introduce it as uh, the main sort of drink of the bourgeoisie. And so many of the brands of, of, of absinthe will um, use the exotic uh, uniforms uh, of the East there as well. So uh, Orientalism is going to uh, permeate all levels of society, even the brands of things that you eat and drink. Well, now let's go on to um, the person who is most associated probably um, with images of the Orient, who is Jean-Léon Jérôme, came from a middle-class family, uh, went to, uh, showed great sort of precocity as a, a painter, uh, came up, went to the École des Beaux-Arts uh, and had a, a brilliant career but just kept going basically. Was one of the darlings of Napoleon III, um, an intimate of the Empress Eugenie, was always invited to uh, the uh, series of receptions that used to be given at the Chateau de Compiègne. So he represented academic art and he um, will, as you will see, produce images um, that suit the regime of Napoleon III. Now, I want to um, start with this particular painting, which is sort of emblematic of um, Orientalism. Uh, well, what do we have here? We um, are very much the viewers of this. Right? We're very much situated uh, in a plane outside. Uh, we're not asked to identify with these people at all. We're looking at this boy, one presumes it's a boy, from behind. Um, he's a snake charmer. We're not really sure what is going on. We're not sure what these people see. So already you've got this idea of the mystery uh, of the East. There's something slightly odd and very exotic, slightly erotic about all of this. However, what is in particular interest in these paintings is the absences, you know, what is not spoken about. The first thing that you is not there is, are any markers of time. Right, this, could, this is a timeless image. This is the Orient. It's, this could be in the 18th century, the 17th century, the 20th century. It is the Orient of, of always. All right. Now, what, there is no reference then to the extraordinary changes that were taking place in this society. Now, he had chosen to, to portray for the East, he portrays uh, uh, Egypt because it was a bit too dicey portraying what was going on in Algiers and in Morocco. There were massacres on both sides, the French were often being beaten, so it was better to produce these images of the Orient in a safer situation such as in, um, in, in, um, uh, in Egypt. So the, at this time, you're actually the Ottoman Empire is reigning there. Um, you're getting the development of the Ottoman Bank. The whole of this Egyptian and also Turkish society is being uh, infiltrated by the West for their own economic reasons. Uh, this is the time when you're going to get concessions for the great railways, which will be put through. The ambassadors from these countries are taken and fated at Paris so that they will go back and set up French schools so that they can, French will be the dominant language, which it, it still is. You often meet people from Cairo who are absolutely fluent in French, and the same thing uh, from Istanbul. So none of this is referred to. This is this idea of the picturesque um, is a timeless image. That's the first thing. The second thing that you're not that we don't actually see um, is that the presence of the white man or the presence of the colonial person. All right. Now it is the the gaze, the colonial gaze or the gaze, our gaze is what brings this into being. But um, we are absent from it. Right now, this painting could not have existed without the existence of this absence, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. 
The third thing which is of, of great interest is, um, and the third absence, is the absence of what looks like art. Right? Um, this has been conceived almost on a photographic, with photographic type of accuracy. When people talk about Giraud and people talk about his great ability to depict detail, you know, how realistic he is, well, you have to ask whose reality is it, right? That's uh, the most important question to look at. So, in other words, you have a completely rational pictorial plane. You have very sort of rational sort of vanishing points, but in particular, you have the imp this extraordinary amount of detail. All right, every tile um, is is depicted, you know, with minute detail, as we saw with Meissonier. Um, all the costumes are minutely detailed. You've even got the light. There's obviously a light source over here making these tiles sh shine in a bizarre way. All of these patterns, this writing, all that here has been um, exactly reproduced. Now he does this in most of his paintings. And what is the effect of this? You see here, you've got the extraordinary detail of this exotic um, tiles, this um, architecture. Uh, forget about the women for the moment. Uh, you've got the, you know, the oranges. All of this beautifully um, depicted. Uh, as I said before, it means that, that by this accumulation of precise detail, you are beguiled into thinking that therefore the rest, the subject matter, is real. All right? Authenticity is supposed to mean veracity. Do you, do you see what I'm, I'm... So therefore you do not question the vision of the artist because it is so real. All right? It looks as though it's a photograph. All right? So relying on this idea of the photograph, um, he can produce this and produce a vision which in many ways, as we'll see, is a moralistic vision uh, of the East. So if we have a look here at his public prayer, um, uh, what do we have? Well, we, you know, there's, there's on the surface of it, and most probably also in, in fact, there is a, a great respect for this society, this, the past, the past of, of this Oriental society, uh, a, a civilization which produces these wonderful mosques. But actually, if you look at it again, it looks a bit like a, a drawing, you know, an architectural drawing with you know all these things going across. Why are they there? Because it, you know, it looks as though it's going to crumble, so you need these trusses to keep it up. Um, also, if you look here at the, the brickwork here, it's not looking in the best possible uh, condition. Uh, you look down at the tiles and they're all broken. Uh, then you actually look at the fact that it's completely open and you've got pigeons probably coming in and sort of pooping all over the entire area of the church. So what is the image that we get? We get the image of a society which is not respecting its great heritage, right? It has been a great civilization. Look at the monuments, you know, look at their practices, but for heaven's sake, they can't maintain it. Thank God we're there. All right, so this really is, is the, the basic idea. The, the West are going to be there to save the remnants of this extraordinary civilization. And you can see that there as well. Now, the other thing which is um, of, of interest is that in each of these paintings, you have the main figure which is supposed to rivet your attention. Here you have the snake charmer, which you know already has chosen the most unusual uh, of, of, of activities. Well, fair enough, I mean, it, it did happen. But he also here again has chosen you know, the very exotic moments, which again is fair enough, um, the whirling dervishes. Now, what you have here then um, is a group of people behind. And if you look at Manet or uh, Dugas and look at the paintings which are being produced well before this, you know, in the 70s, when you have an audience looking at a singer, we are um, invited to actually be part of that audience. We identify with what is going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very much in the 19th century, that these people are dressed in absolutely timeless clothes and we are the spectators, not just of the performer, but we actually are the spectators of this group. At no time are we supposed to identify with anyone in that painting, right? It is um, a, a representation of strangeness. So if you actually look at all of these people, they're all in some kind of state 
um, of traps. Can you see the way in which they're looking up to heaven or, or he, this fellow's in a kind of trance, this fellow here is in a trance, the musician's in a trance and so is he. So in other words, these people exist not just in a kind of immortal, or at least eternal time frame, but they're actually sort of psychologically um, out of our time frame or our, our state of mind as well. Uh, so they are really exotic in the real sense, you know, that they are completely other from us. The other representation that you have here then are these people who are sort of rather childlike, sort of sitting around absolutely fascinated by this dangerous performance. You know, what are they looking at? You know, is it snake? Is it the young boy's nakedness? You know, what exactly is going on here? And what you do get also is, apart from the fact they're in a trance and they're, you know, they're, their civilization's architecturally falling apart, um, is that they are lazy, basically. Now, that's sort of the basis of the Second Empire is, is the, the bourgeoisie, not a Protestant work ethic, because, of course, they're, they're Roman Catholics, but there is this sense of, of you are what you achieve. You are self-made men. This is the time of great entrepreneurship. And so work and constant striving is what makes you come into being. And you go over to the East and you have exactly the opposite. These are people who are physically collapsed. All right, and here you get this Marcos Botsaris. And, and again, Jerome has taken as his subject matter um, not just any um, person off the streets, he's taken the most exotic foreigners already even in, in, in Egypt, even in Cairo. So the mercenaries from the armies, he's take, he often depicts the um, Albanians he, or the, um, the black slaves and also the Greeks who were, were there. So they're sort of exotic even in an exotic um, setting. But again, um, this person is seen as rather is the, the tools of trade of violence here. Um, sort of the sensuality of, of the costume, you know, and self-indulgence of smoking the nagule, you know, which is either tobacco or even hashish, completely collapsed in a kind of, you know, he's not projecting his being out onto, the, onto reality, he's in his own private world, collapsing the way his civilization is collapsing. And this must be true because of the extraordinary detail that we have around here, right, with these wonderful tiles and the decorative nature um, of, you know, the arts of this particular civilization. Now, not only are these people um, exotic and, and, and lazy, um, but also they're childish, right? So here you have, um, this is the joke, um, you've got a, a fellow who's got nothing else to do all day but sit on a couch in a skirt, um, uh, smoking, you know, uh, again, this, these nagule, which, you know, was you know, any upright gentleman smoked a cigar, as we should know. And here, of course, he's got nothing else to do, but he's actually blowing smoke on his dog. So do, do you know what I mean? The, the, the trivialization um, of these colorful people uh, who really are like something out of a kind of Disneyland in many ways. However, they do exist because, I mean, you know, all of this is so true uh, that they must be true as well. Now, um, it's quite interesting to see that if you actually compare uh, two uh, paintings of a, sort of a street scene, uh, I'm going to compare this one with a Delacroix. Now, this is the one painted by Jérôme with this extraordinary accuracy of detail um, and also sort of emphasis on, you know, I don't know whether these dogs are dead or they're just lying out in the midday sun. <laughs> Every, everything looks as though it's collapsing. Do you, do you know what I mean? The donkey looks half dead, the horse looks half dead, uh, you've got the washing, everything's drooping, but you've, you've got, look at, look at the sort of the, the falling down piles of roofs and the darkness and, you know, exotic, and this fellow is naked, he hasn't got any clothes. Um, very, very precise detail. You could spend hours actually looking at what's going on here. Uh, but if you actually look at the same sort of street in McNess uh, by Delacroix, um, it does represent right someone sitting down, they're doing nothing, and so on, and it's you know a rather sort of um, broken down scene again, you know. But, however, it is clearly a painting, uh, and, and that is is what is is important. I mean, you you, you realise that you are in front of someone's interpretation, the seamlessness between the art <coughs> technique and what you know the subject matter um, isn't here. All right, you, you're quite aware 
that there are brush strokes, you know, that this is art, which will of course be um, pushed to its further extent by the Impressionists who impose the brush stroke to show that this is paint on a canvas. It's not an illusion of reality. Now, the other thing which was very interesting at this time um, is uh, Darwin, of course, publishing, I think it's in 1858, uh, his Origins of the Species. You get social Darwinism. Uh, people, uh, other anthropologists have started to be interested in studying other races. And the idea was that uh, Western man uh, really is at the peak uh, of the evolutionary cycle and that all that has gone before has been there simply to produce him. So these other inferior, and they, people really, th that really is the word, lower um, types of civilizations are those which exist over in the East and in Africa. And so it is of great interest to the French in the school system to actually have images of what our ancestors maybe were like hundreds and thousands of years ago. We must capture these images before they disappear forever. So this is what the picturesque is actually. You know, it's when something's about to disappear that it becomes, you know, important. Uh, uh, I won't go into other examples of that. So what you actually had was um, a Cordier, who is a sculptor, was sent by the French government over to take plaster casts of people in Africa and in the East. Uh, and so actually at the Musée d'Orsay you actually have a whole series of these beautiful, really beautiful um, casts done often in bronze uh, with marble um, over them and, and beautiful shells for eyes. And they were taken by using, putting a plaster cast over the person and putting straws up his nose and just hoping that he could breathe. Now, a number of people, of course, died during, uh, well, because if you had plaster rods as part of your, your body, you can't breathe. Um, and they brought back these extraordinary busts. So. Um, these weren't actually then put into museums because they were considered didactic and they were put in the Museum of Natural History. Right? They've only now been transferred to the Musée d'Orsay and considered artworks. They were considered as something that one went and studied. Uh, and so the same sort of thing that you get here with um, Jérôme. He um, takes types of these exotic other people and he chooses the most exotic of the exotic rather than just getting some old man off the street he actually takes the, the Bashu, uh, Bashi Bazouk who were a kind of mercenary uh, soldier who fought for the Ottoman, with the Ottomans and also fought in Egypt. They were extremely unruly and in fact there's an expression uh, in, in French, you know, if you read Bashi Bazouk means that you're just uncontrollable or violent uh, and so on. And of course the black Bashi Bashuk were even more exotic than that. So therefore you get this um, extraordinary um, detail of, of the, the headdress and the um, arrogance and, and uh, you know, sort of otherness of this character. It's a man. Oh yes, you wouldn't have a woman who was a warrior. Um, and also the pelt seller in, in Cairo. All right, again, this idea of, of a type, which of course doesn't exist uh, in our civilization. Now, getting to uh, the two main tropes then of uh, uh, Orientalism, the first one is the violence and the savagery of these people. Uh, and here we have a typical painting here, Heads of the Rebels. So what you have here is a contrast between the gory um, piling up of, of heads, which, you know, despite the fact that, you know, there were wars, constant wars with, under Napoleon, he didn't actually go in for this kind of decapitation, uh, which is seen as absolutely grotesque. And of course, if that isn't enough to turn your stomach, you've also got the heads um, hanging up here. Now, this, this actually happened. I mean, I'm not saying it didn't. It's just that these are the aspects which are brought into relief. And it is contrasted with the beauty um, of this timeless architecture behind. All right, so you get the barbarism um, here with the reference to the uh, sabre for decapitation and this total sort of nonchalance of the fellow sitting next to a pile of rotting heads smoking a pipe. So in other words, the banality of violence uh, in a background of great civilization. 
Now, um, they had to be very careful, um, actually, what they painted and who they painted, because what is, is, of course, the violence that's actually existing at the time is the colonial violence uh, of the Britain, uh, the, the Dutch, the British, and the French, the Portuguese, all of whom are um, invading uh, these other countries, and uh, the French are what we're interested in at the moment, taking over in extremely bloody battles and in committing atrocity upon atrocity to um, subdue uh, these people of North Africa. However, when they finally manage to subdue them, um, they are then um, painted as the noble savage. Do you, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so here they are, and he's extremely dignified, but the, the horse knows its place, he knows his place. Very static painting. Now, this is quite interesting because um, Delacroix went over in 1832 with the Duc de Mornay on a diplomatic mission to get the Sultan of Morocco on their side. And it seemed to have worked. And Delacroix was about to do this wonderful painting of the Sultan of Morocco with the, the, you know, the Legion of Honor around his neck and everything. Unfortunately, didn't get it quite out be, uh, because another uh, uh, up, arise, out, uprising took place in Algeria. The French couldn't control it, uh, finally did, and the chief of the Algerians t took refuge in Morocco. And this Moroccan sultan, who the French thought was their man, s decided to then get involved in the problems of Algeria. Then that, that was when there was a massive joint invasion by the English and the French, by the way, which is most unusual, of uh, Morocco. Uh, this is the Battle of Mogador. Uh, and the Sultan of Morocco is then forced to relinquish uh, Abdel Kader, who has to go back to Algeria. Algeria was the thorn in the side of the French right up to the time of, of the Algerian question in the 18, in the 19, what, 1970s, about 60s, or the beginning of the 1970s. Anyway, so now we have to have a completely different painting. He's, he no longer has his Legion of Honor around the, his neck, and he's seen as um, a conquered um, person. So anyhow, there's no reference, however, to the violence uh, of the West. However, with Delacroix, um, he was fascinated by this extraordinarily violent society. And what does he represent here? Um, Arabs out hunting lions, you know, the sort of the colourful nature, you know, the horses being devoured by lions, you get horses being devoured by everything else. Uh, and also, horror of horrors, um, the way in which the West, these Eastern men seduce, ab, um, abduct, and uh, violate women. And here we, he's managed to put it back into the Bible, the abduction of Rebecca. All right, it's a nice, safe uh, way of looking at uh, sexuality. So by now, we've, we've moved, as I said, Delacroix's romantic artist. Um, his influence is felt by Jerome, but with Jerome you will see that difference in style. Can you see that? You've got the brushwork, you've got a, a sort of a, a, a painting where your emotions are being drawn into it. Here you are, simply, you have the impression of simply being a witness to a scene. And of course, the first thing which is of importance is this um, violation of, of women. And, of course, feeding into sort of male fantasies of the time. Now, what is happening, uh, this is actually at the 1870s, 1870s women are no longer actually content to stay at home. Women are asking for the vote. They're asking for education. They're out in the streets with the development of the department stores. The, the question of women's role, of women's sexuality, of who are women, is something which is of great importance. And so there's this return to the ideal of the eternal feminine, right? This fragile person um, who is the prey of, ma of men. And so here you have the slave auction. Now you can imagine there's an awful lot of tut-tutting amongst the bourgeois men. Oh, goodness gracious, we're not like that. But a bit of lip-smacking, goodness, isn't she lovely? All right, so you've got this kind of, it's a sort of voyeuristic art. And of course here you've got all these men, almost like those men voting it for the jury, isn't it? Um, here, you know, putting their hands up like at a sheep auction. And, but she, of course, is doing the right thing that a nude should be doing, which is instead of you know putting her hand over her crutch or her breast, as you'd think that even Venus de Milo does that, um, no, 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 she just puts her hand over her eyes instead, as you do. 
And um, here we've got other aspects of femininity. Here we have a young, an even younger girl and a mother, of course, with young children also who are going to be sold into slavery and goodness knows what's going to happen. Now this concept of, of, of slavery is something that really lasts right up until when I was going over in the what, 1970s or something to take up a scholarship, my mother was really worried that I'd get sold off into the white slave trade. You know, it was all these stories of people disappearing and never being heard of again and, and so on. It was something that sort of people worried about. Everyone knew someone whose cousin's brother's butcher's wife had ended up in the white slave trade. Um, so there are very many of these slave markets here. You have again this woman who is completely, you know, the clothes have been taken off. You know, this idea of not just a nude but naked, remember, she has been unclothed, and all these men touching her, and but touching her teeth, you know, as, as if, and uh, mm -hmm. all of these other a women, a female, surrounded by these lascivious males. Of course, we're not like that, but goodness, these people would, these bourgeois men would, were going to buy these paintings to have on their walls, right? You've got the development of the bourgeois mansion with its huge rooms that needs paintings, and so Jerome will be selling these fantasies which will be um, put on the walls. So it's a fantasy of, of femininity, but also a kind of a fantasy of the East, which is being conquered by, thank heavens, France. Um, I just wanted to show you this other one as well, this idea of, of, of women being um, displayed before a whole group of men. I mean, you can't get a more clear, uh, you know, for vision of voyeurism basically than that. But it's all couched here beautifully. You know, Franny was a, um, a Greek courtesan who had actually d defiled the Elysian um, rites and so was being taken to trial. It looks as though she's guilty and at the last minute um, someone pulls off her clothes and, and everyone gasps at her beauty. And of course, something which is, be is beautiful um, is, must be divine and so she actually gets away with it. Um, and you can see these gentlemen are looking um, suitably impressed. And of course, she of course is doing the right thing again, shielding her eyes. But you also notice that she um, has no um, pubic hair. Uh, she's just one of these pure, uh, you know, statuary type nudes. So we now get to the main sort of, you know, nexus of, of this fantasies of, of women in the, gosh, in the, in the West, uh, in the East, and that is of women cloistered away in the harem. And of course, it did exist. No one denies that. However, there is an obsession with these visions of women in harems. Um, first of all, you get the mystery. Uh, and here you possibly have one of the best examples of this kind of photographic style art. Uh, you have the impression that you know this is dawn, would it be dawn or, or, or the setting of the sun, but beautifully depicted way in which um, the water uh, is sort of shining, exotic nature of you know the uh, the mosque over in a, you know in the middle of the desert somewhere, slaves you know you know oaring their way across, and of course here you have the harem uh, on their excursion, so this excitement of the of the forbidden. We now get sort of inside the, the, the harem and um, the, you actually get stories from the, the harem because occasionally women, particularly English women who were intrepid travellers, used Lady Montague Smythe or someone or others, written a lot of letters about going into the harem which don't correspond at all to the way in which these paintings show it to be. Uh, and um, what we have here then is, again, it's a very typical um, Jerome type painting um, where you have a sort of great detail of the architecture again but here you have a likeness between this fluttering group of pigeons uh, and this fluttering group uh, of women so sort of you know women they're, they're seen as a group um, they're seen as slightly not not human but I mean they're sort of ineffectual prisoners you know that have to be fed you know there's definitely a kind of a likeness between the two of them and of course they're completely veiled and being looked after by this eunuchs uh, but it appears to be so real doesn't it with the, the shadows and everything it's you have the impression that you could walk into this painting that in fact it's a photograph uh, now we get um, paintings of the harem guard this idea of you know the castration you know the eunuchs and all of this and then you finally get into the interior of the harems and practically all of the paintings of the harems seem to, for Jérôme, be located around pools. 
Now, the first thing that's interesting here with a pool is that you don't have to have women clothed, all right? So um, they're always stark naked. No. So in other words, there's this idea of the harem as this uh, quantity of female flesh. Uh, not to be bought, you see, nothing as vulgar as being bought and going into your local brothel and seeing people in bars. No, 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 these are people who have been specially selected whose entire life is to please one man. I mean, how, how wonderful is that? Uh, so here they all are doing nothing except preen themselves. That's the entire focus of their lives. Uh, and so here they are immersing themselves in water. Now this, of course, was not something that any bourgeois woman would do. Um, remember, you have to be the purity and the, the idea of lack of sexuality led to the fact that women really weren't even supposed to look at themselves when they were washing. Young girls were supposed to put talcum powder on the bath if they ever had a bath so they couldn't look at their own body. Um, so there was this idea that if you wanted to see a woman luxuriating in a bath, you actually went to a, you paid a lot of money uh, in a high-class brothel to, to do this. So suddenly, in the East, Oh, I mean, entire harems, hundreds of women sitting around in bars. It's almost like a kind of schoolboy's dream. <laughs> so um, not only do you have... So you've got the flesh is very much sort of being you know, put forward uh, here to us and the exotic nature of the shoes, um, but also the foregrounding almost in all of the paintings um, of the black slave, black against white, and also this sort of slight frisson of lesbianism. Um, I'm going to have to move a bit quicker. Um, here, of course, we have very much the same idea, but beautifully, um, this idea of veracity, authenticity, the tiles, the exotic east, the, the light source coming in, uh, the quietness of, of the pool. Um, this woman here who is just nothing but flesh. I mean, her backside is three times the size of her head. Uh, so, you know, this idea of ava sexual availability. Um, it, when they, when uh, they came back to do these paintings, um, unfortunately they didn't have people, you know, they couldn't actually paint them when they were over there, so they used these models um, with Nadar, who is the great photographer, actually has a, a roaring trade in photographs that he will make for artists. Uh, so photography actually penetrates very much into the making of art at the time. So I just wanted to show you some more of these. Um, with this, this idea of, of the availability of this woman, she's sitting, it's not a bird cage, it's something that she's sitting on um, so that she, you know, can drip dry, so as to speak. Uh, again, the great detail of, of the writing and the tiles, the idea of the, the ugly uh, slave, you know, well, that's a kind of rather forbidden idea of slavery, the exotic kind of uh, shoes, and she's just, she's just, you know, a body, she's just limp, you know, you can push her any way, this way or that. She is, is just there for one reason. Now, I want you to look at the, the way in which she's um, sitting and you will realise it's very similar to Ange Valpassant Bader. And Jérôme was, uh, at the same time, oh, trying to, I'll just go back to that, um, show that while he is giving a very clear depiction of reality of the East, he is nodding to tradition because this, of course, is what an academic artist has to do. He has to show his provenances and his, his influences and his inspiration, and he is turning to the pure lines of, of uh, uh, in other words, this idea of line uh, over colour, de la quiet colour, remember, and uh, lines. I just want to quickly look at um, more of this idea. The Alumose is someone who's lighting up the um, nagule, nagule, which is the, the um, uh, pipe, but the, in French the word allumeuse also means someone who's, you know, a bit of a flirt, you know, stir, you know stirring men up a bit. And um, it's really quite funny. Um, André Malraux, who was the Minister of Culture in the 70s, was, or the 80s, was invited over to the White House and Jacqueline Kennedy was there, of course, doing her French bit. And, uh, he w came back and sort of uh, said in the French press, so oh, c'est une allumeuse, you know, mm -hmm. and it was translated, she is lighting, she's lighting the candle of culture. In actual fact, he's saying she's a flirt, you know. And, uh, it, was, it was really really interesting use of, of allumé. So th there's a slight sort of, you know, this, this sexual titillation already in that. I just wanted to, sh I just wanted to show you that, the number of paintings of this. And of course, she's this white slave. I mean, how desirable is this? This woman, stark naked, 
sitting doing absolutely nothing. She's a slave, in other words, a sexual slave. Probably she'll do what you want. And she's smoking. She's probably in a different, you know, mindset anyhow. So these fantasies of, of eroticism are being plastered over in the East. Um, I'm going to have to quickly go through these. Um, when it wasn't women who were actually in the harem, you have again the female availability. You know, this idea of West Eastern flesh as being enticing, but here you can have it actually if you go to these ballet dancers, ballet, you know, ballet, B -L -L -Y, dancers, and here of course you have the spectators, the childish spectators. Uh, you can get, you could actually avail yourself of someone who's in the street. And, but the other thing that you get also when you have women in the East is that you not only have those who are submissive, but you also unfortunately have the femme fatale, you know, these absolutely castrating women um, who will be painted by Moral. Here you have Cleopatra uh, and Caesar. Caesar's looking a bit nonplussed in the background. And here she's appearing um, surrounded by a eunuch in all her glory. All the light is on her and the power that she is going to exert through her sexuality, um, which indeed was true uh, over the Roman Empire. And here we have Cabernal, our friend Cabernal, remember from the birth of Venus, um, showing um, Cleopatra sitting by nonchalantly, you know, with uh, these ideas of savagery at her feet, um, trying out poison on, on uh, slaves or on, on prisoners. Uh, so in other words, the sort of tables are, are reversed, aren't they? Quite nicely from the Sardanapalus painting we saw before. Oh dear, I'm going to... <laughs> uh, we have here um, images of the otherness as well of their religion. Uh, here you have um, pilgrims going out to Mecca, uh, this extraordinary group coming towards us, you know, camels rather than horses, um, every possible kind of human type. Um, trudging across the desert, you know, which is something that a Western person would never do. Um, also, this idea of the timelessness of their religion uh, as well. Uh, here you can see um, they're on a roof, um, the spires of the mosques and the minarets go on forever into the distance, i.e. the distance of time, things haven't changed. These people um, are in timeless costume, you know, are they living at the time of Muhammad or are they in the 19th century? Who knows? It is so different. It is eternal. It is something which is respected, as you can see. It's not, um, but it's seen as completely um, different from their own Western civilization. And I just wanted to, this last vision of it is, it's um, a very, a mosque. But again, um, the absolute sort of beauty of the mosque um, has been alighted for um, almost like a kind of an architectural student's sketch of these you know, vanishing points and trusses uh, that you have holding it up. So the sort of magnificence of the arches is, is sort of elided. And then also it's a religious ceremony, but you've got people sort of sitting around here and someone's got his backside to us here and someone seems to be chatting. I mean, what are they doing? It, it, it seems a very dissolute group. And this is this idea of, you know, this is their religion, but there doesn't seem to be any focus. There doesn't seem to be any focus in the, in the space. Uh, it, it's, really, uh, it's really falling apart. I'm going to have to leave that. Um, just the most obvious, the um, propaganda uh, painting that we would probably have from uh, Cabana, uh, from Jérôme, is the uh, uh, reception of the Siamese ambassadors. Uh, at Fontainebleau. So here you have the imperial couple, Eugénie, uh, the little Lulu, who's the Prince Imperial, and Napoleon III, who are receiving the, the Siamese ambassadors who are you know, bowing and progressing along on their hands and knees. Now indeed they did actually do this at one stage go down, but the way in which it's been depicted from the side, you have the impression by this frieze-like sort of painting is that they're actually coming from the left and groveling their way all up to the throne which is higher. And you've got the darker colours from here going up to the light. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it is a depiction of what actually was there, but the way in which it's depicted gives it a completely different um, slant uh, or spin as we would say now. So the um, contrast between um, Third uh, Second Empire architecture uh, and the exotic uh, outfits of the Siamese. I mean, they are seen quite literally as inferior uh, to the Western uh, potentates. Now, I just unfortunately I haven't left myself very much time. I want to look at Bouguereau, who was, a, I think, as a, as a person, is a much more interesting character. Uh, he had a very similar uh, career. But, Prize of Rome, Legion of Honor, Chairman of the Jury, 
uh, was one of the, the you know painters who uh, was uh, had his own school at the Ecole des Beaux Arts. Um, one thing that was interesting, though, even when we look at his depictions of women, is that he, when his first wife died, he didn't remarry for ten years, which in itself is rather amazing. Uh, and didn't r marry the local laundress. Um, he actually married a woman who was an artist in her own right, an American, uh, who was a very strong character, as you can see here, and who actually used to go out and cross-dress so that she could actually um, be out in the streets and, and get in, uh, real access to uh, what was happening in the Second Empire. So uh, an interesting character. Well, of course, um, as an academic painter, now he is the one who is so, um, not revered, but was so appreciated by the American public as well. He um, does all of the things that an academic painter will do, but he paints women. He, the, the main focus of his art is one sort of central female, usually, uh, and it is Western middle-class woman or the, as the upholder of eternal values. So we don't have any of the exoticism with him. So as an academic painter, of course, he, must, he paints uh, antiquity. Uh, and here we have one which is actually in the Musée d'Orsay, um, Venus rising from the sea, the birth of Venus. Um, you will recognize the, uh, those slave girls that we saw with Jerome, uh, the same uh, position and the way in which she's standing, the same lack of, of pubic hair, um, slight deformation of the body. She's extremely long legs, you know, almost like the Barbie doll sort of equivalent. I mean, I'm quite serious, this idea already um, of lengthening of legs. Now, of course, this is lip-smacking good because, I mean, you go home and your wife doesn't even get undressed, you know, uh, when she goes to bed. She even wears a corset in bed. So um, basically going to the museum was uh, uh, an alternative to going to the local uh, brothel. So um, he was very um, impressed by Raphael and Botticelli uh, and is inspired during his time in, in Rome by Galatea. Now, um, the thing about Bougou, I'm going to probably go over a few minutes, is that he paints with a very cold palette uh, and he uses a number of greys when gradually builds up the grey backgrounds with layer upon layer upon layer. Um, very thin layers, so you don't get that chiaroscuro that you would get in a Renaissance painting, but it's almost like um, the kinds of photography which were being produced at the time um, on the silver oxides, you know, the, the, the first kinds of ph photographs used silver, and, and that's the kind of sheen that you get here. And even though she's stark naked and everything, she's not a very enticing, she almost looks cadaver-like to me. Now. He also does what academic painters are supposed to do, to turn one's attention to the eternal values of Western civilization. And so here we have two women depicting art and literature. In actual fact, I think it's a misnomer to be music, as you can see here with the, the lyre, and um, art here with the uh, palette. Right? So these are very sort of Western women as allegory. Um, the allegories then go, and what I'm going to look at is the way in which he depicts the great values of mid-19th century Paris. So here you have a woman um, who represents the mother land. Now, practically all of his paintings um, have a woman at the centre um, with um, a series of young um, children. Now, they're either as children or they're little putty, little, or they're angels. So there's always practically a central... Um, cold, um, expressionless female figure representing something, in other words, removed from time. So in other words, again, you're getting these females, timeless females, right? just as you had with the, West, the Eastern females. Here they are in the West, but they represent Western values, the, the motherland for which one should sacrifice one's life. You see the similarity? Here you have charity, and this could be a Madonna, but again, the same triangular um, painting. Um, here we have um, these little putty, again, who are little children, very well-fed children for, the, for someone who is actually you know, dispensing charity, the bare breasts, and of course the money which is being dispersed. This, of course, is open propaganda. Um, this is the time um, when the Third Republic was trying to show itself as a sort of sharing, caring republic, as opposed to the Second Empire, which, they, which had just been defeated. Um, another painting of charity here. Um, I want you to recognize how much she represents, really, like the Madonna. 
all right? So you're going to very much get a mingling um, of religious art um, with um, the paintings of Bougarou. Now, um, the other trope that he will emphasise in his work, as you can see again, the single figure, um, are the a aspects of the perfect bourgeois woman. Remember that uh, to be a bride, to actually get um, be married properly in, in the marriage market, you had to be pure, you had to be innocent, you had to be modest, you had to have all of these, these aspects. Uh, no one wanted a worldly woman. And so um, he actually documents, or what I've done, I've arranged the paintings sort of in a sequence of documenting the career of the perfect the paradigm of femininity uh, in the 18. 70s and 1880s. Well, here she is, is absolutely pure, right, with the white veil, the modest look. Um, what else is pure? It's a sleeping baby um, and it's, it is a lamb as well. So all painted in these silvery sort of sheens. Then, of course, the other great thing is modesty. So here you have this sort of allegory of feminine modesty, um, her head covered very much like the Virgin Mary as well, but all very cold, pale um, colours. If we actually then move along the career of the ideal woman who is innocent and modest, um, she's also um, training to be a mother because motherhood was the um, acme or uh, the high point of a woman's life. She would have one or two uh, children, they'd be sent out to a wet nurse, whatever, but she then is a sort of a matriarch, she then can retire from the scene uh, and uh, remain in her boudoir. So here you have this young girl, um, she's not even looking at us, she's looking at the child who looks at us, who's obviously a male, right? Um, uh, and so she, it is sort of, she is only going to have any identity through the child who she is going to produce, all right? So it's a very, this is the beginning, the little brother, she's training to be a mother. Well, we then get, of course, the heart's awakening. I mean, they really are quite cloying, these paintings. If you see too many of them, you really feel that you need a glass of water. Um, so here we have um, uh, this woman, again, none of them have any um, individuality. You know, they are a type, right? They're a timeless representation of an idea. Um, clearly not dressed in 19th century outfit at all, uh, no corset, a, a kind of not even really antiquity, a kind of uh, a vague ancient times type outfit um, with these little children who have now turned into fluttering putty because now she's awakening, the heart is awakening, so they're little erosses, you see. But they're all, it's her heart, you see, that's awakening and, you know, she's looking off and thinking, goodness, what is this fluttering? And it's all produced in this beautiful sort of, you know, nymphs and shepherds come away kind of a background, beautifully painted, you know, very real in many ways that this woman almost looks real, even though, of course, um, she's supposed to be situated in a timeless sphere. Well, as she gets older, the little putty now have become more insistent uh, and we have a fluttering, you can imagine the noise, the fluttering of the bug, um, all in her ear, but she seems quite, she looks as though she's got indigestion. She's looking, you know, askance, you know, what can this thing be called love sort of idea. Uh, and the picture crane is becoming very, very um, crowded, but she's resisting. It's an assault. Do you see what I mean? The pure citadel of femininity is being assaulted by these little, harmless little putties. I mean, they're obviously not being to be very naughty, are they? Well, it all seems to have worked because now she's a mother. And um, now she's communing with other mothers. You know, it's a bit like the play group at the local kindergarten. But here they are, sort of in an eternal time frame, you know, partially naked, you know, so we can, you know, you have to be, show that you can paint um, the nude. And also, you, if people are going to buy this, and there are men who are going to buy this, they would like to have something that's a little bit enticing rather than just a semi-naked male. But you notice that it is a male child that is being admired by all of these women, right? So this is the new life. Um, now we get maternal admiration. So do you see the way it's, it's almost like a kind of, you know, Chinese Maoist propaganda. Do you, do, 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 these paintings are on every every wall. They're reproduced. They're in every at every salon. This is what you're supposed to be, dear. You know, don't think of doing anything else. So, but what is also very interesting is that you're now going to. Get, they're very much like um, Madonna and Child type paintings. 
um, which we'll see in a moment, the two children. It could be John the Baptist and uh, Jesus. Um, however, you also do have the maternal image also goes down the track of being not just the middle classes, but also this is what the poor should be doing as well, right? This is, uh, you know, the, the deserving poor and the peasants also too can be um, upright maternal figures. In fact, this is what the ideals and the traditions of France. So here, rather than having those peasants that were out in the fields gleaning, here she is beautifully dressed, um, you know, poor, but deserving, with, um, again, a naked child. And uh, all her attention is on him. The glance is, we look at the child, and she looks at him. Do you know what I mean? She's not actually drawing attention to herself, heaven forbid. We now get these um, paintings of children, um, and here you have this, you know, these clo extremely cloying um, images of childhood, and there's, there's a whole lecture to be given on images of childhood in the 19th century. But here you have, it's a little girl, and so she's depicted quite differently from the little boys. Um, here you notice that she's got, you know, the head on the side, you know, the submissive. Submissive, yeah, it's coquette, but also submissive. You know that you're always told to keep your head up in interviews because you look coy if you have your head down. Um, also, um, notice the sort of Virgin Mary, um, uh, also Annunciation, uh, use of the arms, uh, also the way in which she, her hair has been quite elaborately done, and she's also got jewellery. So there's, there's sort of a slight ambiguity. She's a little woman in the making, albeit um, a very chaste one. Um, also, the other thing that, of course, the bourgeois women at the time were responsible for, for were maintaining the values of the Catholic Church. And there was a great problem because during the Second, uh, at least during the, the Third Republic, men had basically deserted the church, uh, and women were the only ways in which uh, the church could get through to these men. And unfortunately, the, even the power of the clergy there was waning to some extent because doctors were becoming the new confidence of, of women. So um, this idea of, of one of the rights of, of, a, of a bourgeois woman was to inculcate Christianity, and particularly Catholicism, uh, let's be quite clear about that, uh, into the child. So here this child is obviously sick, and of course they're lighting a candle to probably the Virgin Mary. So this idea of suffering, you know, being shared between two, two women and, um, you know, the Virgin Mary, presumably the other woman, um, who will help. Um, more of that same sort of thing. This idea of uh, little girls used to be um, encouraged to belong to um, different kinds of sisterhoods where they pledged their virginity and they used to wear special belts. And it was almost like a kind of Catholic girl guides thing without any of the exertion. Um, <laughs> it really was. Um, also, you get uh, also propaganda. Now, you, if you can remember um, Millet, <coughs> who was painting in 1857, um, these left-wing depictions of the peasants, you know, the poverty uh, that was, was happening, the, the traditional France was being deserted, um, being abandoned for the city. Well, um, here, none of that is taking place at all. We have the gay return. Look at this fellow, he's having a great, he's skipping. It's almost, it's very much like, well, like a kind of bacchanalia, but put into a nice, safe, rural um, uh, field. The child now has turned from putty into being a kind of little miniature Bacchus. They're beautifully dressed. They're having a wonderful time shaping tambourines, etc. So this idea then of the glorification of women's role, even in the peasantry, and so here you get um, rested harvest. She's no longer someone who's so exhausted as you saw with those women who were gleaning. Here she's this seductive young girl, you know, and her seductiveness re really goes right down to the fact she's dreaming, obviously, of someone. She's got, you know, a, a flower in her hands and the deliciously naked feet, which is about as, you know, as seductive as, as Bubor's paintings ever get. So it's a very safe um, uh, depiction of of what women should be right through society. Um, also, of course, um, we now have the deserving poor. Now, of course, the poor had been a real problem, hadn't they? Uh, and then were going to be a great problem, particularly in 1870 when we're going to have the Commune. Remember, with the working classes coming back down from Montmartre, fighting their own government, and when they lose, burning Paris. 
So the, the, there was throughout the second half of the 19th century not just the great woman question, but also the question of the class laborieuse, class dangereuse, you know, working class, laborious classes, dangerous classes. But here they're completely um, anaesthetized <laughs> in many ways. Um, the working class is depicted as a woman, right? and a woman with children. So the putti and the angels have now turned into little orphans, or, but they're all quite well fed and quite, you know, obviously being looked after by this woman who again has a Virgin Mary uh, depiction with the scarf over her head. Well, we now get into um, the sort of the final aspects of, of his art, which are the depictions of the Virgin Mary. And uh, I want to draw your attention to the fact that there was a great sort of movement or renewal of um, Catholicism from about the 1850s onwards, which of course is championed very much by Napoleon III and by his Empress Eugenie. In 1856, you have the doctrine of the of Immaculate Conception, um, which becomes uh, part of the rites of the Catholic Church. What's it called? It becomes dogma. Um, in 1858, just very much afterwards, you have the miracle of Lourdes, right? All of these apparitions of the Virgin Mary, you get the Madame Miraculeuse, Catherine Labouré, who has her vision of the miraculous medal, which has the heart of Jesus, uh, in the 1860s. Now, there was then this huge renewal of religious uh, movements, uh, particularly the creation of a lot of... Um, what are they called? You know, when you have a, like the Sisters of Mercy, what are they called? Orders. orders, thank you, religious orders. And in particular, you get the Sacred Heart of Jesus again in 1858, 1856. Um, by um, 1872, uh, if you wore, an wore a scapula uh, of the bleeding heart of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, you earned indulgences. And in 1899, Blessed Mary of the Divine Heart of Jesus asked the Pope to consecrate the world um, to the heart of Jesus, the Sacré-Cœur. So you get the rise then at this time when Bouguereau is painting the importance of the Sacred Heart, which of course architecturally is embodied in the Sacré-Cœur, which is built um, to expiate the crimes of the Commune, from, it starts being built in about 1872 and is constructed for about seven or eight years. So at about the time that this, um, that this building is being erected with perpetual prayer, as it is now, um, you have this renewal of um, religious imagery um, being produced by Bouguereau and is extremely um, successful. Bouguereau um, was one of the great painters, had commissions in uh, fresco commissions, he was commissioned to paint churches, but also was very um, important also for private collections as well. And a lot of lithographs were drawn from his work. Anyway, you will recognize by now um, this way in which he produces these images, right? Whether it's Venus rising from the sea, uh, whether it was the homeland, or whether it's um, the wakening of young love, the, tr the triangular Renaissance style art form with the uh, figure of Mary here, whose figure, uh, whose face is almost identical to the woman of the deserving poor, um, innocence, uh, modesty, uh, all of these women are couched in the same thing. This is this idea of, the, of eternal purity, uh, eternal femininity. And here, of course, she has um, the putties now have migrated from being little putties to being now St. John the Baptist and Jesus. Um, he also produces a lot of these paintings. Um, again, uh, this is of course the Virgin Mary, but if you eliminate the angels for a moment, this could just simply have been one of those paintings of motherhood that we saw before. So it's an extension now of, uh, not exactly church propaganda, but the importance of the of religion in the essence of the upper class female French woman at the time. Now, I can't imagine anything more annoying if you're trying to get a child to sleep than having uh, you know, people with violins and flapping wings right in your face. I mean, really, uh, they're obvious, but they're, they're drawn with such extraordinary sort of accuracy that you have the impression that they're there. And I just wanted to compare this, um, whether he was actually drawing on the, the Caravaggio or not, but it was uh, a trope, the idea of the angels uh, you know, putting the baby Jesus to sleep. 
here they're both sound asleep and evidently you can actually read the music uh, you know and actually play this <coughs> music uh, from this score well by 1900 then you get the sort of apotheosis of his style uh, with Mary uh, at the center uh, here with the, the child who, who is blessing the world uh, presumably 1900 what is happening in France the French uh, are at a fairly difficult stage uh, they are facing uh, the Germans who are across the border uh, arming themselves they have these immense cannons which uh, had been exhibited already in the international exhibitions and would soon be turned on the French uh, they are twice the size of the French uh, they have twice the, the population uh, all of, of French society is, is sort of feeling that in itself in many ways uh, it's losing its direction uh, it is losing its, its stability and so it's, it's, it's no coincidence that you get this renewal um, of, of Catholicism uh, at the time of, of 1900 and uh, what is really going to happen then with these two conflicting visions of, of women? Uh, here we have this extraordinary The Oreads by Bouguereau, which is really sort of showing the way in which the sort of fantasies um, of, of women, uh, people are as using escapism to um, not face the problems that are existing in France. So these paintings that are being produced now of even women, you know, paintings teeming with naked women, uh, uh, cascading with backsides and breasts going right up to a, a very athletic woman at the top, as you can see. Uh, and of course, there's three rather bemused satyrs at the, at the bottom looking, well, this one's holding this one back, but you know, who knows? Um, so there's almost this sort of uh, escape into fantasy that, that you're getting um, at the about 1900, you know, before French society virtually melts down in the trenches of the First World War, uh, it, which marks basically the death of God for, for many people, and of course it marks the old end of the old class structure. There's huge the the, the French soldiers sort of mutiny against their their leaders and so on. So this then is this sort of last vision of escapism uh, into um, antiquity on the one hand. Um, while really what is happening uh, with women's naked bodies uh, in the streets of Paris we'd already seen in 1877 the real reality uh, is Dugas prostitutes on the terrace looking very much like sort of monkeys who have actually come out of the lower levels of sort of evolution that's the reality as opposed to the teeming nymphs and shepherds coming away um, here we have the other fantasy, uh, which is the fantasy of the East, you know, with all of the exotic, forbidden sensuality that it can produce. Uh, what happens to that vision by the time you get to 1900? Well, it turns into soft porn. Basically, you now got photography which uses the trope of the availability of, of Eastern flesh, um, and they are produced as postcards and sold basically on the streets. <laughs> So in other words, while all this is going on, you've got these fantasy worlds into which the French uh, are escaping in many ways, there is another kind of art which is actually depicting what the fracturing of society. This has already begun with Cézanne at his Bibemus quarry just outside Aix-en-Provence where he takes the earth and he is putting it into the building blocks um, of creation and they are sort of fracturing in their in their in their structure and will eventually turn into cubism which will be basically the new fractured society from which the 20th century will emerge so that really is the way in which i want to finish um, this series with the importance of academic art which really only now is being looked at so thank you very much <laughs>